Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I'm going to start off today's lecture by telling you guys a joke. This is the story of a husband and wife and they're going on a journey and the husband asks his wife, honey, how long are you going to be? As a typical woman, she responds, I'll be ready in five minutes. 45 minutes go by, and the mesquite husband is still waiting. The wife finally comes down, he's really angry and he's like, let's go, let's get in the car. We're getting, we're getting late. So as they're driving, the wife feels really, really upset. She's like, you know, I shouldn't be so, like, uh, I shouldn't procrastinate this much, I shouldn't get delayed this much, and you know, I feel really bad you know, delaying my husband. So she sees this beautiful tree as they're driving, and she says, honey, you're so beautiful, just like this tree. And the husband says, shut up and let me drive. <laughs> you know, a typical man can't control his anger, subhanAllah. So now, as they're driving, the husband is having conflicting emotions. He's like, my wife, she's such a good person, but why is she always late? I shouldn't be mean to her as well. And in this state of conflicting emotions, they're driving past a farm, and he hears the braying of a donkey, the mooing of a cow, the barking of a dog, and he says, honey, let me guess, these are relatives of yours. <laughs> she goes, you're right, they're my in-laws. <laughs> now, I start off with this joke. I start off with this joke. Not to prove that women always get the last word. We know that's a reality. But I start off with this joke to prove a point. As human beings, we have an idealized concept of relationships. The most idealized relationship we perceive in terms of human relationships is that of love, right? We've been indoctrinated through Disney, we've been indoctrinated through Hollywood that every love story ends off with a happy ending. However, when you actually fall in love, you actually get married, you realize it's a completely different story. It's true for like the first six months, then it's like all downhill from there, right? Now, there's a relationship that is more important than the love story of our lives. And that is the ultimate love story. And that is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for a lot of people, when they don't understand their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in fact, it messes up every other single relationship in their lives. So we try to reconcile how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so loving, so caring, so merciful, so generous, yet why do we individually go through so many problems and through so many trials? And that's what we want to try to discover here today. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testing us? How do we find the resilience not only to be patient, to be grateful in those trials as well? And to start off this, dis this discussion, I want to share a human perspective of trials. You know, as human beings, it's very, very evil and nasty to find pleasure in someone else's calamities. We should never feel happy, regardless of how terrible of a person we think they are, we should never ever feel happy at someone else's problems and calamities. However, a lesson should be derived from their calamities. And that is to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are not put in those trials. To thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are not put in those trials. And now what I want to do with you now, my dear brothers and sisters, is I want to tell you a story and then relate the biggest trial you have been through with this story. So perhaps you got divorced, perhaps you lost your job, perhaps you didn't get into the degree program that you wanted to get in. Right? All of these are trials of life related to the following story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me to study at the Islamic University of Medina. And when we graduate, we don't have like graduation ceremonies, but rather what we do is we go to Mecca and we perform Umrah. So this is a story of a colleague of mine who graduated from the faculty of Hadith. Him and his family, his wife and his three kids, they went to perform Umrah. And on their way back to Medina, they're riding in their car and the husband, he sees a truck behind him. And this truck is going really, really fast like 120 miles per an hour. So you can imagine like an 18 wheel truck zooming down the highway. Not only is it zooming down the highway, but it's going right, it's going left, it's not staying in its lane. Now the husband in a state of confusion, he's like, should I speed up, should I slow down, should I pull over, what should I do? He doesn't take any action whatsoever. And as the truck comes next to him, it actually forces him off the road. Next to him was a huge ditch. So as he's driving and his car now goes off the road, the car rolls over once, it rolls over twice, and it rolls over a third time. 
And with each turning over of the car, someone in the car is passing away, subhanAllah. So the husband passes away. The oldest son passes away. The second son passes away. And the mother and the youngest daughter stay alive, subhanAllah. Now the youngest daughter, even though she's sitting in the back in a car seat and she has her father's seat in front of her, she's in critical condition. She's cut up, she's bruised, and there's like a lot of problems going on with her. The mother, even though she's sitting in the front and the windshield is right in front of her, she escapes this accident with barely a scratch on her. It was as if she wasn't even in an accident. But the miraculous thing and the strange thing about her though, was that she didn't have any recollection of what happened. The ambulance came, took the child and took the mother, and the mother had no clue what was going on. She couldn't remember her name, couldn't remember her husband, couldn't remember anything. So they keep her in the hospital for two weeks. And after two weeks, they decide, look, we can't keep her anymore, her condition isn't improving. So some of the other sisters from Canada, they came and they took her from the hospital and took her back to one of their houses. They had lunch, they had tea, they're having dessert. And as this is going on, one of the sisters decides to tell her what happened. Look, your husband was studying, he graduated, you guys went to perform Umrah, and on the way back you got into an accident. Where your husband passed away, your two oldest children passed away, and your youngest daughter is still in the intensive care unit. Now even though she had no recollection of this story, her motherly instinct kicks in, and she's like, what am I doing here? Take me to the hospital. They take her to the hospital, and I want you to imagine the space between myself and that table right over there. That is the space between her and her child. And subhanAllah, as she walks in, literally that is when her child flatlines. Dies very right in front of her eyes, subhanAllah, her last and, and youngest daughter. Now when you hear such a story, I want you to think about how does this relate to your problems and your trials. It seems very trivial, doesn't it, subhanAllah. Literally, as we tell young children, don't cry over broken crayons, don't cry over spilled milk. And that's what our trials are when we relate them to trials that are much, much greater than ours. Now let's change the mood in the room and go into how do you actually react towards trials? When calamity strikes in your life, how do you react? And in order to do this, I need, you to, tell, I need to tell you a more personal story. And this is the story of my sister and myself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with a sister that's four, year, four years older than me. And as we were growing up as our typical siblings, we hated each other. Like we used to sabotage each other to the best of our ability. Really, really like bad stuff, subhanAllah. But her being older, she always had the upper hand. And I remember when her friends used to come over, it wasn't sufficient that I would go into the basement or go into the room. She would kick me out of the house. She's like, my friends are coming over, you can't even stay in the house. So I was like, whatever. You know, I'd go play with my friends, go play basketball, go hang out. And the time would eventually would come, I was like, I need to do homework, where do I do this? So I used to go to my aunt and uncle's house that live about 10 minutes away from me. And they too have a younger daughter who's six months younger than me. I spent so much time in their house that I ended up developing a sibling rivalry with my cousin, subhanAllah. I would get a new bike, she would have to get a better bike. I got a laptop, she would have to get a better laptop. And this is the way it continued. Now what really used to hurt me and get me down was three or four times a year, we'd get our report cards. I'd come home, I'm all happy, I'm like, mom, dad, you know, I did amazing in school, alhamdulillah. They're like, what'd you get, you know, how'd you do? And I'd read out my grades. And eventually at the end, it always came down to one question. Did you beat your cousin? That's what it came down to. <laughs> now, I justified in any way I possibly could. I'm like, look, mom, dad, she's a practicing sister. She wears hijab, she wears jilbab. She has no social life, you know, she's always studying. Obviously, I'm not gonna beat her, right? That's what it came down to. But as is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every weak and oppressed person will have their personal battle of Badr. And they will have their day of victory. And my day of victory came the day we went for our driving exam. <laughs> so the driving exam day comes, she's going first, and I don't admit to it, but literally I'm at home, I'm like, Ya Allah, please let her fail. Ya Allah, please let her fail. <laughs> so she comes back from her driving exam, and she has tears in her eyes. I can't tell other tears of happiness, tears of sorrow, what's going on? Till she opens her mouth and she's like, Mama, Baba, I'm so sorry, but I failed. And in the back of the house, I'm like, Takbir! Allah <laughs> So now, 
the pressure is on me. If I don't pass my driving exam, I will have no self-respect left and no dignity whatsoever. So now I want you guys to do my driving exam with me. I get into the car and the driving instructor is Mr. Aziz. Welcome to your final driving exam. I would like you to reverse the car out of the parking lot. I was like, sure, no problem. Put on my seat belt, check the mirrors, turn on the car, put the car in reverse, and I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going back, boom! <laughs> you hit something. Now I want you to think about what's the first word that comes to your mind. Don't say it out loud, okay? <laughs> For a lot of us, it's a four-letter word we should not be saying. Now the danger of that word is imagine, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not decree this for any of us, you die in such a state. That's the last word you die on. What a scary reality that is, right? And this teaches us the value of being able to control our reactions to calamity and to trials. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ That those people, when they're struck by calamity, they're struck by, struck by trial, they say, indeed to Allah we belong, and to Him we shall return. Meaning the believer's natural reaction is that he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now not only should we naturally turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you should find a way to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your trials. Why? Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he says that when the Sahaba radiallahu anhu were tested, they would thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three things. Number one, that their trial was not in their faith. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't allow their faith to waver. They lost things from this dunya, they didn't care. But as long as their faith didn't waver, they would thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. Number two, they would thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the trial was not as great as it could have been. An individual loses a hundred dollars, he should thank Allah he didn't lose a thousand. An individual loses a limb, he should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's still alive. There's always something to be grateful for because the trials can always be greater. And then the third and last thing that they would thank Allah for is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them to be patient and keep their composure. How many times have we seen someone in moment of strife and calamity, they become obscene, they become vulgar, their face changes, they become ugly, they become abusive, they start breaking things. So if you have the ability to keep your composure and to be patient, then this is something to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. So what would the companions thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for in their moments of calamity? Who can tell me? What would they thank Allah for? Raise your hand if you know the answer. What would they thank Allah for? Go ahead. Okay, so they thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it not affecting their faith. What was the second thing that they used to thank Allah for? Go ahead. For that the trial was not as great as it could have been. Fantastic. And what was number three? What was the third thing that they were th thankful for in their moments of trial? Go ahead. That they're alive? Close. I'll give it to you anyways. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them to be patient and keep their composure. So this is what they're grateful for. So now the question arises, okay, we know where we want to go. We want to be not only patient in our moments of trial, but we want to be grateful as well. So how do we get to being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our moments of trial? It all starts with changing our perspective of trials. And the first thing you need to do, and this is principle number one, learn to expect trials in your life. Does mankind think they will be left to say we believe and not be tested? How do we make this practical? I want you to imagine if we did that driving exam again, and I went boom, and I asked you, you know, what word came to your mind, someone's gonna say SubhanAllah, someone's gonna say La ilaha illallah, someone's gonna say Allahu Akbar. And if you're thinking about someone you didn't like, you may even say Alhamdulillah, right? That is what our natural reaction would become. Why would you have this reaction? Because I just did the exact same exercise that you knew was coming. So you have a controlled reaction to it. As opposed to when something catches you off guard, you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, you're unprepared for it. So when you learn to expect trials in your life, you don't get into such a deep comfort zone where you're just like on cruise control and you're not even controlling where your life is going. But you learn to expect trials, you're constantly on your toes and you'll know how to react to those trials. 
Principle number two, and pay attention to these, please. Principle number two is that these trials are a calling back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? I want you to think about your time in primary school, in elementary school. What is the favorite part of the day of every child? It's when they go on lunch, when they go on recess. They get to go and play with their friends, they get to go and have a good time. And when the bell goes off, they have to walk back into the class and they're really angry and upset. Why can't I just keep playing? And the teacher explains to them, look, it's okay to have fun at school, it's okay to play around, but you're at school for a higher purpose and a higher motivation, to get an education. Similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends trials our ways, Allah is telling us, look, it's okay to have fun in this dunya from time to time, but don't forget your greater objective and don't forget your greater purpose. And that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of us, we will only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we are forced to. We will have to be kicked in the knees, down to the ground, and that is when we will make sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And without that, we wouldn't. So from time to time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends trials our ways to show us how much we need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah loves our worships so much that He will sometimes compel us into it. Because only the thankful will praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in moments of prosperity. But everyone will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of adversity. Because that is when you recognize, look, there's nothing I can do, the situation is out of my control. I need to turn to a higher power. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, these trials are a purification of us. They purify our akhlaq and they purify our sins. An individual that's being tried, he's not going to be arrogant, he's not going to be proud because he recognizes he's not in control. An individual, when they're being tried, let them remember the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that the son and daughter of Adam are not pricked by a thorn except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving some of their sins. So the greater the trial, the greater the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gives us an example, and it could be any one of us in this room today, that an individual shows up on the Day of Judgment when their deeds are being weighed, and their good deeds are brought forth, and they think to themselves, subhanallah, these good deeds are nothing. How will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enter me into paradise with such few deeds? And as they're waiting for their bad deeds to be weighed, they start to remember and reflect the lies that they told, the things that they saw that they shouldn't have looked at, the things that they heard that they shouldn't have heard, and they start to despair that they are doomed and they're destined for the hellfire. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them that you have been forgiven, so enter your paradise. So you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, what did I do that is, being, that is allowing me to be forgiven and entered into paradise? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, it was the patience you showed in your moments of trial and calamity. So you can imagine, subhanAllah, that in this dunya you may question as to why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testing you? Answer that question by telling yourself that perhaps this is the trial that I need to go through, that Allah has mercy upon me and enters me into paradise. And you'll get through that trial. Number four, these trials are a reminder of the true nature of this world. When you look at this dunya, shaitan wraps it in such a way that he makes you think it's filled with luxury, it's filled with glamour, it's filled with beauty. But when you get down to the nitty gritty about this life, what is it all about? Stealing, cheating, killing, deception, oppression. That's what's happening in this dunya. So when calamity strikes, your utopian bubble or a utopian perception of this world, it pops. And Allah reminds you that, look, your whole life comes down to literally 30 seconds. And that is the last 30 seconds that you spend on this earth. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ That actions will be judged by the last of them. So he who dies upon a good deed will be raised upon a good deed. And he who dies upon a bad deed will be raised upon a bad deed. And I want to share another story with you. And this is the story of another colleague of mine, an imam in Canada. That in the month of Ramadan in 2011, it was the 17th night of Ramadan, and his daughter had just finished serving him some tea at uh, iftar time, just like she used to do every iftar. And this night, after she served her father, she went out to the balcony, they live on the fifth floor, and she had her own cup of tea. She's drinking the tea, 
and we don't really know what happens, but it slips out of her hand, and she goes chasing after it. And from the fifth floor, she falls off the balcony, and she passes away, subhanAllah. That night, her father went to the masjid, led the people in Isha, led the people in Taraweeh, and acted as if nothing had happened. The next day after Fajr, when they pray her janazah, that's when the community found out that his oldest daughter had passed away, subhanAllah. And they started to notice from that very day that he changed. He was no longer smiling, no laughter, you know, interacting with his people, no longer, you know, being social with them. So being such a loving community, they said, you know what, let us all come together and send the Imam for Hajj. Let him, you know, get closure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Imam, he gets ready to go for Hajj. The eighth day of Hajj arrives, subhanAllah, and he starts feeling a sharp pain in his kidneys. So he goes to the hospital and the doctor tells him, look, your kidneys are failing. You can't go for Hajj. And for the first time, the Imam shows some emotion and he says, you're going to try to stop me from Hajj. I've come all this way. There's no way you're stopping me from Hajj. They're like, sir, you can't go. Your kidneys are going to fail. You might die. And he's like, I don't care. So they set up a portable dialysis machine with him. And he's going through Hajj with this portable dialysis machine, subhanAllah. Now I want you to imagine the valley of Arafah, everyone's in ihram, everyone is making dhikr and making dua. And as Maghrib time is coming, I want you to picture this valley where everyone has their hands up, each one is making dua for themselves and for whatever they want. And you have this imam that can't even stand, so he's laying down on the floor. And he's making dua and he's saying, Allahumma ghfirli, Allahumma ghfirli, Allahumma ghfirli. Oh Allah have mercy upon me. And at that very time, the adhan for Maghrib goes off. And people, they're repeating after the Mu'addin as they're getting ready to leave for Muzdalifa. And as the adhan finishes, they turn to the Imam and they notice that he passed away in that state, SubhanAllah. With his last words being, Oh Allah, forgive me. Now you may think to yourself, SubhanAllah, what a beautiful way to end. But his story doesn't conclude over there. The next day after Arafah is the day of Hajj, as the day of Eid. And the cream of the crop of the Ummah, as well as thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people are in Mecca and Al-Masjid Al-Haram to pray their Eid prayers. So you have four million people there with the cream of the crop of the Ummah performing their Hajj. Who's leading the prayer that day? Not other than Shaykh al sudais They finish Salat Al-Fajr and he makes the famous call for the Janazah prayer. As-salatu ala al-mayyiti Allah. And then he says, Allahu Akbar. And then four million people, they're making dua. Allahumma ghfir lahu warhamhu wa'afihi wa'afu anhu. Now I want you to think about that, subhanAllah. If you could write and plan your own death, would it be more beautiful than that death? It wouldn't be. It's not possible. And that shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ultimately in control and He knows what He's doing. That if His daughter didn't pass away, he wouldn't have gone for Hajj. If he didn't go for Hajj, he wouldn't have died at Arafah. If he didn't die at Arafah, his janazah would not have been led in Al-Masjid Al-Haram. If he didn't have his janazah in Al-Masjid Al-Haram, he wouldn't be buried in Mecca next to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. That's something to think about. It reminds us of the true nature of this life, subhanAllah. And point number five, the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always near. You know, there's a story we tell our children as if it is a fable, it's a fairy tale. And that is the story of Yunus alayhi salam. Yunus alayhi salam, he's devoured whole by a whale. And I want you to empathize with him. You're Yunus alayhi salam, you're in the belly of a whale. What do you do to get out? Let's change up the mood in the room. You're inside a whale, what are you going to do? Are you going to tickle your way out? You know, perhaps he'll spit you out. Or maybe you're like, you know what, let me practice my kung fu. It's like Jeet Kune Do time, right? And you try kicking the whale from the inside, and the whale doesn't even feel anything at all. You're really hungry, you're like, okay, let me eat my way out of this whale. You start eating at the whale. You will spend multiple lifetimes, you're not going to be done with this whale. What are you going to do, subhanAllah? There's nothing that you can do at that time, other than to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَنَادَ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ so in the, depth, in the depths of the darkness, he calls out to Allah, Oh Allah, there's no one worthy of worship except for you. And I have been of those people that wronged and oppressed themselves. Now here's the beautiful thing about our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah is so generous, so merciful that every time we call out to Allah, every time we ask of Allah, Allah always gives us more than we ask for and better than what we ask for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَكَذَلِكَ نَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ That thus we saved him from that which was distressing him. So his dua has been answered. But did the response of Allah stop over there? No, it didn't. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And thus we shall save all of the believers as well. As long as what? They have the same reaction. You recognize the greatness of Allah and you recognize the oppression of your soul. When you put those two together, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always be in your aid and you will be victorious. So the one that saved Yunus alayhi salam from the bottom of the ocean in the belly of the whale is the same one that will save you. The one that saved Ibrahim alayhi salam from the fire will save you. The one that saved Musa alayhi salam from the tyrannical army of Fir'aun will save you. The one that forgave Adam when Adam made a mistake will forgive you as well. Just call out to Allah. Now let us recap everything we've taken in the lecture and then we'll get to our conclusion. The first thing we learned in our lecture today is that our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while it seems it is a difficult one, it is very simple. Allah loves us and cares for us and from time to time we will be tested. You learned how you react to trials and tests. You learned that not only do you want to be patient in trials, you want to be grateful as the Sahaba were grateful that Allah allowed them to be patient, that the trials were not as great as they could have been, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not try them in their faith. You learned today that by understanding five principles, this will lead you to be grateful. Number one, learn to expect trials in your life. Number two, these trials are a means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, these trials are a purification of your akhlaq and your sins. Number four, these trials are a reminder of the true nature of this world and how we should ultimately long for the akhirah, the abode of peace. And number five is that the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always around the corner. Now as I conclude, I want to ask you guys to do a small exercise. It'll take you 10 seconds inshallah. So you will do me all a favor and close your eyes please. Everyone close their eyes. I promise I'm not going to do anything weird inshallah. <laughs> Close your eyes, inshallah. Anyway, I'll count up to 10. And what I want you guys to do is imagine as if you're in Jannah right now, what would you be doing? Okay? Okay, open your eyes. Fantastic. Now, this exercise teaches me three things. Number one, who the rebellious students are. Because naturally, as I tell everyone to close their eyes, there's always like one or two students, they're looking at like this. And they're like, no matter what you say, I'm not closing my eyes. I was like, fine, you know, that's okay. Then you meet a second category of people. And these are the people that are like utterly confused. They're looking around, they're like, why is everyone closing their eyes? They're like scratching their heads, they're like, am I supposed to close my eyes as well? And I'm like, yes, close your eyes. And then category number three, or the third, and this is the primary reason behind it, and this is to show us how pathetic our Jannahs actually are. Because if I could take a picture of you guys, no one was laughing, no one was jumping for joy. Some people were smiling, but the worst part is you have some people frowning. And I was like, SubhanAllah, how terrible are your Jannahs that you're dreading to go there? <laughs> you know, what's going on? You and I need to have a talk after this <laughs> lecture to see what's really wrong. Why don't you want to go to Jannah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He describes Jannah to us, He tells us, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٌ That we will have each and every single thing that we desire in paradise, and He will still have more to give us. We can't comprehend that. Because in this life, we can't even get everything that we want, let alone fathom, having more than what we want, subhanAllah. Now you'll notice that when Allah describes punishment in the, in the hellfire in the Qur'an, very specific, very detailed. When Allah describes Pleasure in paradise, very general. Why? The mind will naturally wander off to what it wants. Each and every one of us wants something different. So here's a technique that I have developed. And this is what I want to share with you. Like after, what is this now? Seven years of like family counseling and youth counseling and marriage counseling. People come into my office and they share some like terrible stuff with me, subhanAllah. 
domestic violence, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, addicted to pornography, like everything you can think of, I've heard it. And from time to time, it really weighs down on my shoulders. So I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, I don't have much time between appointments. How do I snap out of it? How do I change my frame of mind? And I developed this technique that I'm sharing with you right now. So that when you're in your moment of trial, when you're in your moment of difficulty, and you need something to get you through, to be patient, think about Jannah at that time. And what needs to be done is a detailed description of paradise, a detailed description of Jannah. And I'll show you, share with you my description so you get an idea of this. Now, one of the things I like to do in my free time is I like to go fishing. Now, the sad story of my life, even though I've been fishing about six or seven times, I've not caught a single fish yet, subhanAllah. <laughs> Okay, and now let me tie this into something else. How many people have seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory here? Raise your hands. It's like all the sisters, mashallah. <laughs> so the guys are like, what's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? In Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know, I went to a daycare growing up that was very, very underfunded. And Friday was supposed to be fun day. So for 30 weeks, we used to watch Charlie and the Chocolate Factory every week, subhanAllah. And I got so fed up of the movie, it was like not even funny. It's fun. I'd rather like sleep than go to fun day, right? But every time I used to see this one scene in the movie, my heart would still jump for joy. And that is the point in the movie when they enter that chocolate room. And when they enter that chocolate room, it's particularly that river of chocolate. It resonated with me because Allah describes you know, rivers of honey, rivers of non-intoxicating alcohol, rivers of water, rivers of milk. And I was like, hey, if I can have anything in Jannah, you know, those sound so boring, subhanAllah. I want a river of chocolate. <laughs> and I want to go fishing in Jannah. And when I'm in my boat, I don't have to fish and, and like, you know, chase the fish. The fish will be like, Naveed, please catch me, Naveed, please catch me. <laughs> It'll be like the end of my misery. <laughs> now you catch your fish in this dunya, you got to descale it and degut it. It's not a friendly process before you get the final product. But now the beautiful thing in Jannah, it's like these fish are also made out of chocolate. And it's like you've had your chocolate fish. You're like, man, you know, I ate too much. I need to go burn some calories. Let me go swimming. You jump into this river of chocolate. And it's like, you know, when you jump into a swimming pool, like too quickly, the water goes up your nose and it like hurts your head. But this is like, you can imagine it's like lint liquid chocolate. <laughs> and you're like, man, this is so amazing. And then I want you to imagine it's like a perfect 22 degrees the sun is out, there's a mild breeze going through. You look to your right, your family's having a barbecue, everyone's having a good time. You look to your left, all your friends are there, they're playing on the beach. And then you look above you, and you see like the malaika worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're like, subhanAllah, could things get more beautiful than this? And that is like what my jannah looks like, that's what you know, I would like to see. So in your moment of trial, in advance, prepare your descriptions of paradise so that you have something to motivate you and to get you through. And inshallah, you will succeed. And inshallah, you will pass. And from now, bi I want to extend this invitation to you that when we get to paradise, inshallah, I want you guys to come and swim in my chocolate river. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.